Hey there everyone, Carl here with Trailbite Studios, and before we begin, let me just say, I absolutely love this special. I remember very distinctly when it aired. I was in 4th grade, it was 2005, and I was obsessed with lizards, dinosaurs, snakes, and dragons. I was 11 years old at the time, and my family had just moved to a new house. We didn't have access to cable television yet, and I wanted to see this special so badly. I didn't have any friends at my new school, so I couldn't go to someone's house and watch it. So I did the next best thing. I bought the book version of the special at a Scholastic Book Fair from my elementary school, and I poured over it and my Dragonology books tirelessly until the obsession faded with time. I still have those books to this day, and I cherish them with love. When I was 15, my dad finally upgraded our basic cable package and gave us access to channels like Discovery, History, and Animal Planet. But by then, it was too late. The year was 2009. I was a completely different person. I was just finishing up middle school and starting high school, and I desperately wanted to fit in with everybody else. So I forsook my passion for paleontology, animals, and dragons for cool new things like MP3 players, video games, and pop music. Hey, everybody makes mistakes, okay? Anyway, it was my ninth grade year, and I was channel browsing, looking for something to watch. Of course, Mythbusters was on, but I wasn't feeling that. So I switched over to Animal Planet, and boom, there it was. A rerun of Dragons, a fantasy made real. After all that time, I had forgotten how badly I wanted to watch it, until it was there in front of my eyes. The pictures from my book coming to life. Needless to say, it was genuinely a magical moment for me. And then, it was over. The passion slipped away, and I returned to my desperate attempts to fit in. Now, after all these years, I revisit Dragons, a fantasy made real. The story is as follows. A well-preserved dragon corpse is discovered high in the mountains of Romania. It was trapped inside an ice cave that was only just revealed due to an unseasonably warm winter. Upon discovering the dragon corpse, the researchers also discover a human body. They take both corpses back to their lab for analysis. After a full body scan, they confirm that the dragon is a juvenile, and did not yet know how to breathe fire. The human had been burned to death, and therefore this dragon could not have been the cause of the human's demise. They perform a pseudo-autopsy on the dragon, to figure out how it could fly, breathe fire, and how it lived in general. While performing the autopsy, the story cuts away from the researchers to the late Cretaceous, where we see the prehistoric dragon. This prehistoric dragon is also a juvenile, and is being attacked by a Tyrannosaurus rex. Its mother returns and fends off the rex at the cost of her own life. Some time passes, and the corpse of the mother lures in another older male dragon. The juvenile is forced to take flight for the first time to avoid becoming prey. After some more analysis by the researchers, we return to the Lake Cretaceous, where the juvenile is now a young adult, and confronts an older male dragon for territory and breeding rights. The juvenile wins, but his victory is in vain, because the narrator then explains that the prehistoric dragon was wiped out in the KT event, the same extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs, and only the marine dragon survived into modern times. In time, the marine dragon re-emerges onto the land, and evolves into the forest dragon, a long, slender creature adapted for life on the Asian subcontinent. The narrator further explains that the forest dragon competed with humans during the Upper Paleolithic Era for natural resources, and for control of the dragon's most powerful weapon, fire. We then return to the autopsy, where the researchers present evidence for the final extinction of the mountain dragon, the species that was discovered in the ice cave. The narrator elaborates that the mountain dragon used to feed on mammoth herds, but no longer can since the extinction of the mammoth. The narrator also explains that the mountain dragon's territory has been pushed back to the harsh fringes of its ranges. The female mountain dragon mates in a skydance ritual with a male, and lays two eggs in a nest. Both the male and female care for the eggs until the male lets the temperature of the nest get too low, and the female won't tolerate his presence anymore. Only one of the eggs hatches and survives into adulthood. In order to provide food for herself and her chick, without the help of the male, the female begins preying on easy targets, livestock from a nearby farm. She becomes a nuisance to the town, and the local lord and his squire seek to kill the dragon. They succeed in killing her chick, but she in return kills the lord's squire, but the lord escapes to the town relatively unharmed. Some more time passes, and winter is approaching. The mountain dragon starts to go into hibernation. She is awoken by dragon hunters, who have come to kill her. In her weakened state, she is unable to breathe fire, but succeeds in killing all the dragon hunters before being struck down herself. With her demise, the mountain dragon, the last surviving dragon species is no more. The researchers return to the ice cave to find the body of the mother dragon and the mercenaries, still trapped inside the ice, 
confirming their suspicions. Whew! Now that is what I call a story. I've got to say, watching this special even all these years later, I still felt some of the magic. That's because there are a lot of good things about this special, and I mean a lot. And I'd like to take the time to acknowledge them right now. First, the presentation is immaculate. The story is compelling and the editing is great. It's paced perfectly and every species of dragon gets just enough time in the spotlight to make the arguments compelling. Second, the effects are astounding. Even by today's standards, the props look good. I mean really good. They used actual flamethrowers to create the fire effects and the mountain dragon corpse looks so darn real. Now, the CGI is a little dated, but that's to be expected from something made in 2005. And truthfully, it looks better than some later paleo media, like Jurassic Fight Club. But the practical effects are immaculate. Third, they stay within the bounds of reality and science for the most part. It's pretty incredible to think that something like a dragon could actually evolve given the right environmental factors and external pressures. Evolution really is an amazing process. Fourth, they stay consistent in their own arguments and reasoning. Nothing in this special feels like a cop-out. They can consistently explain all the characteristics of each dragon within the bounds of their reasoning and arguments. Everything and every discovery in this special has well thought out arguments and points backing it up. Nothing is arbitrary. Fifth, I like the involvement of humans in the dragon's story. The humans are not the centerpiece, and they shouldn't be. Instead, they just use the humans to ground the story in reality and make the dragons feel more real. <sighs> Alright, now let's rip it a new one. Okay, this is what you've all been waiting for, where we tear into this special from a scientific, evolutionary, and logical perspective. As a side note, a lot of the things wrong with this special are very nitpicky. That's because the team behind it actually put a lot of care and effort into it. But who cares, right? Everyone's a critic. The biggest and most egregious error I found in the entire special is something so simple. I don't know how the consultants working on it missed it. The marine dragon, the forest dragon, and the mountain dragon are all hexapods. They all have six limbs two pairs of legs, and one pair of wings. One of the first things you learn in Biology 101 is that all modern vertebrates are tetrapods, meaning all modern vertebrates only have four limbs. That is because all modern vertebrates share a common ancestor in bony fish that had paired pelvic and pectoral fins. From these early tetrapods came all other species of vertebrate on planet Earth. Look across the animal kingdom. Every vertebrate has two pairs of limbs, from frogs to horses and from humans to snakes with their vestigial limbs. Therefore, these species of dragons could not have evolved from the same ancestor as all other vertebrates. Now the special could have argued that dragons evolved from a bony fish with three pairs of fins and stayed within the realm of reality, but the prehistoric dragon blows that possibility out of the water. Because lo and behold, it's a tetrapod. Its wings are quite clearly modified arms, much like bats, pterosaurs, and birds. Now the special doesn't claim that the modern dragons are descended from the prehistoric dragon, since it was wiped out during the KT event. The special argues that all modern dragon species descended from the marine dragon, which is a hexapod. However, the special claims that the marine dragon and the prehistoric dragon share a common ancestor, which would be impossible if the prehistoric dragon is a tetrapod and the marine dragon is a hexapod. Now it is possible that the prehistoric dragon is in fact a hexapod, and its front legs have become vestigial and disappeared into its body over years of evolution. That brings the possibility of the dragons being hexapods back into reality. But in a bold move, the special claims that dragons are related to crocodiles, sharing a common ancestor in the distant past, which absolutely destroys the possibility of the dragons being hexapods, since crocodiles and all other reptiles are descendants of the first bony fish, with pairs of pectoral and pelvic fins, making them tetrapods. So right away, something like the mountain dragon could not exist in our reality in accordance with our understanding of evolution and biology. That brings me to another point. What exactly are these dragons? The special never answers that, 
It stays vague regarding the dragon's classification. Are they reptiles? Birds? A weird derivation of dinosaurs? Are they endotherms? Ectotherms? The special never says. They mention it in the bonus features on the DVD. But before the story of dragons could begin, there were many questions that needed to be answered. We wanted to know how they could fly, how they could reproduce. What would they have looked like? How would they have breathed fire? Are they warm? Blooded? Are they cold-blooded? What would their physiologies, their biologies, their behaviors have been like? How big would, it, would its wings have been? What proportions would its body have had to have for it to be able to fly? But they never actually say what they are. I think the special is implying that they are ectotherms, because we see the mountain dragon sunbasking, using their wings like solar panels to soak up the sun's rays, which is totally fine and believable. Lots of reptiles live in colder climates, and go dormant for the winter. So why doesn't the special just say that they're reptiles? Are we supposed to guess it from their appearance in the special, and their appearances in pop culture? Or are we supposed to guess it because they share a common ancestor with crocodiles? If you're trying to make a fantasy creature plausible, it's important to classify it within the bounds of reality. Give us a base classification to start with, then go from there. Before we move on and talk some more about the dragons, I want to just take a minute and critique the autopsy performed on the dragon corpse because it's unrealistic. The researchers should have been in full hazmat suits, with gloves, masks, and medical instruments. The way they nonchalantly handle the dragon's corpse, touching it, putting their bare hands inside its gut and mouth, is just completely wrong. When working around preserved ancient animals or people, researchers have to worry about dormant diseases, decomposing tissue, corrupting DNA, and a plethora of other issues that require full protection for the safety of everyone involved and the safety of the specimen. In contrast to the autopsy performed on the dragon, have a look at how researchers handle this preserved baby mammoth. The solution of X-ray images is more difficult on dry tissue. For this scan, the team uses a thin wooden capsule to keep Luba cold. Okay, back to the dragons, specifically the biology and morphology. We already talked about how they are hexapods, and therefore could not exist as reptiles in our reality, but let's discuss the details. First off, there is almost no sexual dimorphism between any of the male and female dragons that appear on screen, minus their coloration. That's a little unrealistic, considering most species have at least some amount of physical differences between the sexes. Take a look at species like the American moose, mandarin ducks, or a plethora of other species. Second, and to put this very bluntly, these dragons are shrink-wrapped. You don't want to be like this. This is disgusting. This is awful in every way. If I could kill it, I would. But I legally can't. But I've considered it. They're basically just skeletons with skin covering them. They look like early reconstructions of dinosaurs, or the, uh, dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. They lack realistic attributes like lips, fat reserves, or proto feathers. You know, dino fluff. Things that animals typically need to survive. Even the musculature is a bit too lean. I can excuse the mountain dragon because it's implied to be on the verge of starvation due to human infringement on its habitat, but the others are pretty inexcusable, especially when it comes to the size of the pectoral muscles. They are just too small. Remember that relation to crocodiles we talked about earlier? That comes from the inclusion of a false palate inside the dragon's mouth. Now, this could be a case of convergent evolution. Convergent evolution refers to when a similar trait evolves in two unrelated species, like wings in both birds and mammals. The traits serve the same function and are similar, but are not the result of speciation or divergent evolution. So convergent evolution could be the cause of the false palate in dragons, right? Well, unfortunately, the relation to crocodiles is further stressed in the special, and leads the viewer to believe that these hypothetical dragons are indeed related to crocodilians. The false palate is what allows the dragons to breathe fire by expelling hydrogen from its flight bladders, which, when expelled, mixes with platinum ground up in its molars to release a huge column of flame, 
The inside of the mouth is also said to be hard and resistant to fire, but that leaves me wondering about the teeth. How did they evolve to cope with fire pouring over them? Are they bone? Do they have a thicker layer of enamel than other animals? Breathing fire comes with more than just a few issues. The flight bladders are a very important adaptation in the dragon's anatomy. They, obviously, allow the dragon to achieve flight by storing hydrogen inside the dragon's body. Hydrogen is 14 times lighter than air, after all. The hydrogen is created internally by bacteria found inside the dragon's stomach. Then, it's stored in the dragon's flight bladders. This biological mechanism assists the dragon's relatively small wings when flying. It makes the dragon lighter. Another mechanism aiding in flight is the composition of the dragon's bones. Like birds, the hypothetical dragon species all have hollow bones. More specifically, the dragons have hollow structured bones that keeps their skeletons relatively light but still strong enough to support them while on the ground or in flight. Since we're already talking about the dragons, let's look at each species individually. Starting with the prehistoric dragon. This, again, is obviously a tetrapod. But more specifically, it belongs to the order Theropoda. Take a look at its feet, which have three toes, very akin to the Tyrannosaurus rex featured alongside the prehistoric dragon. That leads me to believe that this dragon is more closely related to dinosaurs than the marine dragon. I'd also like to look at the wing anatomy of the prehistoric dragon, because it is unlike pterosaur wings, and more similar to birds and bats. Bats specifically. You can see that just like in a bat's wing, the fingers of the prehistoric dragon's wings have become elongated, and a membrane is stretched between them to form the wing. More interesting though is that the finger still visible at the top of the wing seems to be prehensile. That is to say that the prehistoric dragon can move this finger independently from the others, which we see it do when it clings to the side of the mountain with those digits. This scene is what also led me to believe that these wings are indeed modified arms, since we see them bend forward to cling onto the rock. If the wings were modified shoulders, this action would be very hard for it to perform. All that is to say, this thing is definitely a tetrapod, and technically a wyvern under dragon classifications. Next, let's talk about the marine dragon. And honestly, I think this is the best one of the bunch, as in, it's the most realistic despite it being a hexapod. Why do I think it's the most realistic? First, the body plan works well for a creature that is meant to be adapted for life in the water. The marine dragon has a long, large, flat, muscular tail to use for locomotion, and is long and slender, with small, almost vestigial wings and very small legs. In short, it's streamlined. This is a realistic body plan and is seen in many real-world species today. The streamlined body plan is a wonderful example of convergent evolution across the animal kingdom. Otters and crocodiles are an excellent example because, even though they are relatively unrelated, they share remarkably similar body plans. The marine dragon also has countershading on its body. Countershading is a color scheme in which the top of the animal is generally darker and the underside is lighter. This is the same color scheme that whales, porpoises, and sharks have. Countershading acts as camouflage for predators and prey alike, making the animals blend in with their environment when viewed from either a bird's eye view or when underneath and looking up at it. For now, let's just not talk about the wings. We will get to that. Up next is the forest dragon, and oh boy, the forest dragon. Let's start with the body plan because it is total garbage. It looks like a wiener dog, or like somebody forgot to hold shift when they were transforming an object. I mean, look at him. He's just a little long boy. He's a, just a little, little lanky guy. He is an elongated lad. He's a schlank junge. <laughs> I mean, look it. <laughs> okay, but seriously, I know that the forest dragon is supposed to be based off of a traditional Chinese dragon, so it needs to be long. However, this body plan is not well adapted for life in the deep forest, or life in general, really. The length of this dragon comes with a host of problems, most of which it'll need a chiropractor for, because the sheer amount of pressure on this dragon's spine would cripple it before its 10th birthday. The length was excusable in the marine dragon species because it's aquatic. The buoyancy of the water would take the weight off of its spine, counteracting gravity. But on land, a body plan like this just wouldn't work. In accordance with its spine, let's talk about the head. It is huge! I don't know. Some of these look like they need a little more time in the oven. Yes, a little too much T-Rex DNA in that one. Ooh. 
There is no way it has the musculature in its neck to support a head that massive at that angle. Even if the bones are relatively hollow, the weight would be astronomical. It is possible that this dragon is an efficient ambush hunter, using its camouflage to blend in and its long neck to strike suddenly. However, I would argue that the length of this dragon hinders its movements in a dense forest setting and makes it an inefficient hunter. I think it'd be something akin to driving a truck and trailer through an obstacle course while trying to keep up with a Lamborghini. The smaller, more compact Lambo would have a much easier time than the longer, more drawn out truck and trailer combo. The same principle holds true for the forest dragon. It would have a hard time navigating through dense trees because of its length, and have a hard time navigating through rough terrain because of its relatively low stature, making it a very inefficient hunter. Okay, I'm done bashing on the forest dragon, let me talk about the aspects I like. I love the coloration and camouflage pattern. It looks like a tiger, and tigers are cool. Also, I love the premise of it actually cooking its meals before eating them. Dragons have always been portrayed as extremely intelligent in myth, so if this dragon was real, and people observed it cooking its meals, that could play into the myth of dragon intelligence. It's a nice little touch that the producers didn't need to add, but they did anyway. Last but not least, we have the mountain dragon, the quintessential classic dragon. With two pairs of legs, a set of massive wings, and a face that only a mother could love, this is THE dragon. Unfortunately, I have the most problems with this dragon. First and foremost, it's implied to live in cold climates. Look at this design. It doesn't look like it could eat gazpacho and survive the night, let alone live inside an ice cave and sunbask in the snow. I know that snow reflects sunlight, and that would help warm it up, but come on! Wouldn't it have some proto-fluff, or at least a layer of fat inside its body to protect it from the cold? I know reptiles do live in cold climates, but they're normally only active during the spring and summer months, when there is little to no snow on the ground. The mountain dragon, on the other hand, seems to thrive in the snow and ice with almost no way to keep warm. I know that I already said I could excuse the mountain dragon because it's implied to be on the verge of starvation due to human infringement, but no, I can't because all the mountain dragons seen in the special look exactly like the female, which is supposed to be the starving one. These things just look out of place in the snow and ice. I'm sorry to the producers, but my suspension of disbelief was shattered the second I saw something like this living in a cold habitat. Now, we have to talk about the wings. I avoided them with the marine and forest dragons, but now we have to address them. This thing is a hexapod, no doubt, but look at the design of the wings. It's the same design as the prehistoric dragon. It's a modified hand. It's a bat wing. Whatever this dragon descended from had three pairs of fully functioning limbs, which I think is just hilarious. But the single biggest offense I have with the mountain dragon is the idea that it would breathe fire on its eggs to keep them warm. Yes, eggs have to be kept warm. Yes, crocodiles use compost piles to keep their brood warm. And yes, the temperature does determine the sex of the newborns. But no, you cannot breathe fire on an egg and still have a viable embryo inside. The special does go out of its way to say that the shell is fireproof, which is great, but the embryo inside is not. That would be like if you got into a giant metal egg, and then someone put it in the middle of a huge bonfire. Yeah, technically the egg itself is fine, the metal is fireproof, but you're not. You'd cook alive inside from the heat. Okay, I guess we should also talk about the sky dancing ritual, and how that implies that dragons have cloacas, but honestly, I'd rather not discuss hypothetical dragon reproduction. Overall though, I have to say each dragon works well in its role. They all sport interesting, unique designs, and they all feel like real animals. That of course is the most important part of the special, making the dragons feel real. Through an ingenious combination of science, presentation, and special effects, the production team was able to bring a fantastical creature from our imaginations into reality. That brings us to the conclusion, the wrap up to tie everything together. So let me say again, I love this special. There's something truly magical about it. It may not hold up to the utmost scrutiny and be so scientifically driven as the special claims to be. I mean, come on, all you had to do was make the dragon's tetrapods. But nothing Animal Planet has done since Dragons has felt as passionate or as special. The time, effort, and care 
that the team put in all those years ago can still be felt when you watch the special today. Sure, the CGI is dated, and the facts are fungible, but I think that's the real beauty behind Dragons. It has a charm to it, a sort of rough polish. I know that's a misnomer, so let me put it like this. It's like reconnecting with an old friend. Sure, things have changed, you've gotten older, started families, and made new friends, but there's still that connection, that polish, underneath all the rough. Something shimmering, deeper, an old memory you share with each other, a laugh, a smile, or a cry. It doesn't matter. The polish, the care, and the love, most importantly, is still there.